to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast with Borg, Betts, and a baller. Welcome in. It's Wednesday, March 13th on the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Borgannoni, and I'm joined by Matthew Betts and Mike Wright. Hello, beautiful people. I mean, I, I wish I had something more exciting to say. I don't because Mike just crushed it right there. Hello, beautiful people. Welcome in. That's why I'm the <laughs> pro. <laughs> I, I I feel like Mike was directing that more at our audience. Um, yeah, 100%. I was not talking to you, Uggos. <laughs> Are you saying that we have a face cool. for podcasting? <laughs> now, that, now that we're on YouTube, people just get to just roast us all the time? Yeah. Yeah, welcome to the party. Hey, you know right. what? And now, you know, before it's like... I don't have to worry if I got some, something in my teeth, right? Like it's like whatever. But now you're like, like I just gotta go use mouthwash. I have to actually brush my teeth for these shows. <laughs> Not how like an many, idiot up here. How many episodes until Bets is just shirtless potting? <laughs> oh, next week. Next week, okay. So over under is one more episode. I mean, HR, you just you tell me when to uh, hey, look, when to pull the trigger. This this is an entertainment factor. This will, <laughs> I mean. The the the, uh, the audience will be a thirsting. There's gonna have to be some sort of uh, warning on our YouTube description. I don't know how that yeah. works. What the algo? <laughs> yeah, too too sexy. <laughs> That's where we're crossing over. Like at this point, episode fifty two of the Dynasty Podcast. That like, hey, there was a phase where they were going on a good run. Then they went to video, mm. and then yeah. uh, it just was taking a different direction. Thanks to and now they're banned. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's gone places. This episode. I think we will have one of our more interesting dis- discussions because we're going to be talking about this year's tight end class where there's one dude that you probably know about and then a bunch of other dudes you're like, I think I've heard about them because I saw them at the combine running around in their underwear. And that's about as far as you probably know about this year's class. And so we'll get to dive deep into the tight ends and really ask some questions. What do we care about at the tight end position? Do we care about certain measurables, certain drills of the combine, certain production marks, and then we'll have a giant discussion on where you should draft Brock Bowers because that's what I, I, I kind of want to land at is he's good, and I think you should land at yeah. that he's good. But then where will he go in the NFL? Where will he go in rookie drafts? And where should he go in rookie drafts? That's, those are different questions, right? Yeah, I, I can agree with all of those. I find it pretty... Uh... Funny, for lack of a better word, of when when Kyle Pitts was coming out, it was, oh, once in a generation, a tight end talent, just an absolute freak. And which the draft capital said, I mean, was I believe he was the highest drafted tight end, or at least tied for the highest drafted tight end of all time. And here we are, not, not even five years later, a generational, once in a generation talent coming in from college. So maybe maybe we need to chill out on that. We just say there's a really good player coming. We do in. throw out the word generational a lot. Uh, maybe we just need some new language. We'll 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 invent some new words today for Brock Bowers to kind of describe. It's a once in a year opportunity. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, right now he's going in one quarterback drafts at the one o four. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's take it easy. But I don't know. We'll is see. that so? That's behind the, the big three wide receivers, I assume, right? And then Bowers. Yes, is that where he's going? Yes, and then Thomas is going right behind him. Uh, then you got Caleb Williams. That's in one quarterback. Now, last week we did the Superflex mock draft on here, and I think I took him at the one o nine. So I think I would feel more comfortable at that spot. But uh, I think that's where you're going to have to take him somewhere between those spots, and. That is a lot. So we'll talk about where tight ends have gone historically in rookie drafts and if that's been a good bet or bad bet. It's probably not been a good one. Uh, So, yeah, it should be a good discussion today. The UDK Plus, it's out. And this week is the week where we're wild, wild men out there updating this thing nonstop with all of the free agent signings. And more importantly, the... Opportun- the team opportunity is one of the best features we have. And Bets, I know you're going to town on this right now as we get signings, even during this recording. But kind of explain to people why that's such a good approach to look at teams. It's, it's not just, oh, this player is going to sign there, but here's actually the vacated targets, vacated carries, and the ecosystem of a team. 
Yeah, that's a term you and I throw out a lot on the DFS embedding show. I, I love that term because it just kind of gives you an idea of where teams are at, not only from like a financial standpoint as far as what draft picks they have, uh, free agency money, which they're spending currently, um, but then also, like you said, the opportunity of, of where are these guys on the depth chart, who actually is competing for touches. And rather than just like seeing like, oh, this guy signed for this much money, here's what it means. And just having a quick reaction, you can actually take a step back, go in the team opportunity charts and pages, get our take on what it means for short term and long term, especially for dynasty is so important. So um, I love it. We use it all, all off season. You know, this thing stays updated whenever we get news. And this week, like you said, the news is flying fast and furious. We're updating that on, you know, an hourly basis at this point. So one of my favorite resources we have in the UDK plus. Yeah, you go to udkplus.com, updated rookie rankings, startup rankings, rookie mock draft. And I wanted to zero in on rookie mock drafts because we're at the point in the process where it's easy to overthink things and yet we still have so many things we don't know. So penciling in a player and just saying, oh, well, this is where this guy's going to go because we've done two months worth of mock drafts is kind of, you know, it's short-sighted. So my question for us is what is the biggest mistake to make with rookie picks at this point in the process so here we are mid-march we got a month and a half so bets i'll let you start what would you say is one of the biggest mistakes that either you've made or you, you just see made all the time i think just being realistic with the value of of what your pick actually means um, and what i mean by that is assign names to the pick that you have and obviously you're not going to know exactly which player you're going to get but when you throw out in a trade or you talk about the value of your pick and you're like oh man i got the 108 this year like that sounds great, but if you're like, man, I'm throwing a dart on AD Mitchell this year, you know, you got to kind of know who's going in that range. And just you know, in our most recent, excuse me, uh, mock draft in the Dynasty Pass, it was Caleb Williams at that pick. Now, not saying Caleb Williams won't work out for fantasy, but the 108 to someone else might be like, oh, I can get a stud wide receiver with this pick. But you could, but probably not, right? Like you're probably getting a guy that has a lot of warts in their profile, like Mitchell. Uh, like Troy Franklin, who didn't have the best combine as far as his weight. Um, you might get Caleb Williams. Like It's just not necessarily a difference maker. But I feel like right now when you say, oh, I got the 108, I got the 109, you kind of feel like you're holding this like unknown that could be incredible. And I think people overvalue that range of rookie picks. So just make sure you're kind of assigning what names you think you might have on the board with the pick that you have and understand it might be really valuable if you have you know the 102, 103, 104. But if you have that kind of late first, like to me, it's not as valuable as the pick itself might seem. That makes a lot of sense. I would say the the biggest mistake that I see that I have also committed uh, myself is, is you drafting for team need over just the the better player of you know. I mean, we we do these for certain reasons. We get scared of certain players landing spots like Jalen Waddle when he went to the Miami Dolphins despite being what the fifth sixth, or sixth overall right pick after chase sixth in the NFL draft people loving the player he landed with the Dolphins which felt terrible uh, at that time that doesn't feel as terrible right now but he I mean he dropped I think he was like the 107 108 where People are taking third round running backs over a top five Trey pick. Sermon. Trey Sermon. Yeah, not not to say that. Look, just because you drafted the at fifth overall doesn't mean it's going to work out. You know the the Corey Davis draft year was pretty bad. I mean, you had what well, Corey Davis, John Ross, and Mike Williams, and the only one who really worked out was kind of Mike Williams. And then if you had stashed Corey Davis for years and years on end you finally got something out of him for fantasy. So I'm not saying the, the the fifth round player can't bust, but it's just it's about probability and odds and you're look we want our running backs out of the rookie draft cuz drafting for running backs in season you're just you're getting a a fantasy asset that things can change so rapidly. Uh, our guy, you know, or not our guy, sorry, the wrong phrase, but we, Tajay Spears has kind of been a player who's been talked about a lot in this process of he's a good player. And with Derrick Henry gone, he may have an opportunity here of if you can get Tajay Spears really cheap, I'm interested in it, but it has to be cheap because he still has a long way to go in the process of avoiding pitfalls, avoiding traps. And, uh, well, immediately, 
he fell right into the first trap because Tony Pollard is going to the Tennessee Titans. I'm not burying Tajay Spears because I think he is a good player and you should not. Don't bury players who are good because their opportunity seems to be not the best. But Tajay Spears, had you traded him Sunday uh, versus trading him as soon as free agency opened, his value just just changed dramatically. For sure. Uh, so the the point being, trying to get me, get myself back on track of like I want to draft my running backs and in in the rookie draft, but don't do that at the expense of a highly drafted first round wide receiver. Because running backs are going to get pushed up the board just because every yes. single person in your league has needs. Like they they need like somebody probably was going into the season saying Tajay Spears, man, he's my RB two. I'm excited about this. You know, he's got this mm-hmm. upside in this offense, and now you're looking at your team and you're like, I, I desperately need a running back. So yeah, I think people overvalue and, opportunity. Uh, and tight end is part of that. Oh, for sure. Of of you're like, dude, I I gotta have a tight end. I gotta have Brock Bowers. You know, my team is tight end needy. And you end up bypassing uh it, it just for an example, it worked out great for me, but I had the one and the three back in the Jamar Chase year. I really like I broke my, you know, I fell in love with Najee Harris, so I broke my own rule. I took Najee Harris with the 101. Thankfully for me, the 102 ended up being Travis Etienne. They also broke the rule of because it was, oh, first round running back. So I got Jamar Chase at three. You know, it's it, so it, be careful. Be careful out there, despite when you want these players bypassing really high draft capital, good production profile players. I think we're also at the point in the process where we move from, I know for me, the way I evaluate is I look at production first. You know, we have our production profiles. I kind of see, okay, this is where they're at based on their age, you know, their dominator rating, everything else we talk about in the dynasty pass. And then I moved to a film evaluation. And then we just moved to the part where we got to the combine. I think what you're seeing is that you're moving from a player who's like, I have never even seen them on film. That's just production to now I'm looking at it with my eyes with the film. Now I'm looking at what they did, you know, in their underwear running around at the combine. And what happens is you move from what only your eyes can see. And I think what happens is you begin to overvalue what you can see where there's just so many unknowns that not just with draft capital, but like a lot of these players aren't going to work out in the NFL at all. They're not going to get a second contract. So don't make up your mind at this point in the process just based on what your eyes can see. And that usually happens from one play you saw from a highlight reel or one tweet you saw from somebody that, you know, cast somebody in negative light or a positive light. I, I, I get so many responses where I'll tweet out a chart where I don't mention anything to do with fantasy. Just here's a chart. Here's all the players that were drafted with the draft capital. And someone goes, oh, that must mean they're really bad for fantasy. I go, no, no, no. Don't make up your mind because of this one thing. Like use this as a piece of the puzzle, but it's frustrating for me because I want to hold all of these things in tension. And I almost like doing that where it's easy just to focus on. This is what my eyes tell me. This chart says this player's bad. It's like, no, it's, it's not the only thing. Like there's some scores. We'll bring up some RAS scores. You'll go, this player was really, really good. And this is a good thing for them. We could also say this person's RAS score was terrible. And yet there's still a path for them. They're not like completely dead. Right. Or are they dead? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, it depends. Well, tight end might be we'll tight end might be a different story today. And I did they get drafted in round seven or in round two? <laughs> I stopped looking at tight ends in uh, like just in all of my spreadsheets where it's like if you got drafted past round five, you're done. I mean, you're just you're done. You're not going to make a difference. It's basically George Kittle, and that's it. Yeah, Kittle was round round five. five. Right? It's like yeah, and, and his his uh, athletic production was awesome. It's just it was at Iowa, so the production was kind of um, you know stunted a little bit, but. Once again, if you want to go into the Ultimate Draft Kit Plus, I mean, we have dynasty tips for you. We have rookie mock drafts, and we'll be adding more to that. But yeah, let's let's talk about tight ends, guys. Hey, rookie. Welcome to the NFL. So we've done quarterbacks, we've done running backs, two episodes on the wide receivers, if you want to go back through there. These are our thoughts. You know, all of these were... Now, half an episode on the tight end position. <laughs> um... I... I don't know, guys. I don't know how you feel, but whenever we talk about tight ends, it's like this player could work in the NFL if they're used as a quote, like flex tight end. Like they're given enough 
opportunities to go out wide. And then we talk about certain tight ends that are more like a hybrid move tight end. That's kind of the NFL term or the, the football term, like Kittle, who it's like, you can move him all over the field. He can block, he can run. And then there's just the big dudes. It's like, oh, you're 6'6", 260. You work as an inline tight end. And 90% of the time you won't work for fantasy. So I feel like we have to use some of that lens when we talk about these guys, because to be honest, most of these guys will not be relevant for fantasy two to three years from now. You know, we'll find a diamond in the rough. We'll talk about Brock Bowers, but we, we just need to keep that in context that with tight end, there's a couple of dudes that stand out and the rest of the crowd is just a bunch of guys. So let's talk about why the combine is so important and why you guys personally think like, this is something we do need to pay attention to where I kind of, I know with wide receiver, I said, Hey, you know, there's some things that are just kind of fun metrics or fun events for them to run, but they're not really like necessary. So Mike, you personally, you take the combine a little bit more seriously. Yeah. It, Cause I want with, with the tight end position, I think more than anything else is your opportunity matters of the scheme that you are put into. And so, as I mean, you got to think about it like a, the layers of it. S- and so finding the opportunities, but then I need a player who is athletically gifted enough, should they get that opportunity, which are very rare, then they can succeed and then exceed expectations. Where it, not not every tight end who's given the, given the Travis Kelsey role or a Mark Andrews role very few are actually going to succeed, but we have found now after doing this for years and years is I don't know, it, it it actually seems like the the true athletic outliers at the position those are the guys who still small probability, but it is a higher probability yes. of hitting than guys who are just average athletes who can get out there and block. So it's it, it where with a wide receiver. And in even a running back, like athleticism matters, but it is not the the end all. Where if a, if a running back runs in like the you know low four fours, you're like, oh, look how slow this guy is. Because I see, I see guys run the forty clocking in the four threes and the high four twos. It actually doesn't matter. Like it's nice to have that speed because you can hit a home run, but you can be just fine. Of uh, you know, I, Kareem Hunt, Dalvin Cook, just a few examples off the top of my head terrible 40 scores but great running backs when they were in their prime but it, uh, to get to get everything together to get the Voltron for the tight end position to become Travis Kelsey or or Andrews you you really do need that athletic backbone on top of being put in a position where no this is just a scheme where the head coach really likes to pass the ball to the tight end or you find a quarterback like Drew Brees or Dak Prescott, where you just you know from years and years of history, this player features the tight end a lot and more than other teams do out there in the NFL. Yeah, I think that's that's well said. And just to speak to it on top of not just that we like the ability for these guys to be athletic and create after the catch, which Kyle's done some research on that is super important for fantasy. You need those type of guys, not just the you know catch a five five yard hitch and fall down. Uh, that does nothing for us, right? The and Ertz. Yeah, oh man, dude, <laughs> he's gonna be catching so many hit routes in Washington this year. Um, it's gonna be great. Um, John Daigle put this out on Twitter. Uh, athleticism at tight end has finally started to catch the eyes of front office members since 2017. 68 percent of participants to eclipse both a 4.7 40 and a 10 foot broad jump have been selected by day two. So, in other words, the NFL is starting to use this data now more. So, we should pay attention because obviously draft capital correlates much better especially in dynasty to what we should expect yes and i'll just jump in real quick for for those who are newer to the process in athletic testing the 40 yard is showcasing kind of like your long speed where when you look at the, the broad jump and the three cone that's that burst that's that initial step of how fast can you accelerate and you can find those, you know, in the player profile. So if you want to click on a player, you know, yeah. you can actually see like, oh, here's what they did. We do their speed score. So we actually like get to show you how explosive this player is, all that stuff. You can find that in the production profiles. But 40 and broad jump and vertical matter a lot to production, not just like here's this player is going to be drafted. But, you know, these teams are going to take notice. And we've talked about that a couple of times where it's like 
players that just test out of the water, like Noah Fant, all right, in 2019, his production profile wasn't that crazy considering he came out the same year as his Iowa teammate, TJ Hawkinson. But when you look at his relative athletic score, which we'll use that term, Raz, um, it was awesome. It's the fourth best over the last eight years at 9.89. He was drafted 20th overall. Did it work for fantasy? Not really. It, you know, it's a situation where he was with the Broncos, with the Seahawks. And so athletic, it, it, it correlates really well with draft capital, correlates really well with production. And yet we understand there's so many other things that also have to go right. It's like Mike was saying, is, is there an opportunity in the offense where you can be a Kelsey or Andrews, where you're getting funneled 20 plus percent of the targets. And that's still really rare in the NFL, right? Like, you know, you're getting eight or nine teams where you're getting a tight end with a 20% target share. So just because a guy tests really well does not mean all of a sudden he's going to be awesome for fantasy. We'll talk about Theo Johnson out of Penn State who basically broke the RAS score. And there's a lot of other things you have to say, like he'll get drafted high, but you know, what about his game? Why wasn't he used more? So we'll talk more about that. Um, what do you guys think about with college dominator scores for tight ends? Because it is the position where we care about touchdowns, right? It, it's a, a yeah. lot of times you're getting a, a Robert Tunyon season, who, by the way, had a crazy dominator score in college, um, where you're looking, you're searching for guys that can get eight plus tight end, uh, touchdowns in a season. So it's a little different than wide receiver because we're not getting as many targets. You're not going to see these guys, most of them with more than like 60 targets, but I care a lot about this and I care a lot about their yards per team pass attempt. So those are two other metrics, but any thoughts on dominator score with tight ends and what we're looking for? I'll just jump in and like dominator, certainly not a perfect metric by, by any means, but I, I think it does help, especially helping you with where it's not so obvious on the tight ends. You know, we said George Kittle was a fifth round pick. I don't remember what his dominator was, uh, it, but I'm saying guys who aren't the first round picks, the super sexy tight end picks, the, produ- the, the what they do, their production profile in school can help you. It can help steer you to to players who could break out. And we'll repeat this so many times: hitting on a tight end is such a low percentage chance of happening. But you are so you're just you're scratching and clawing at things that just you're like oh well this correlates I've now you know increased my percentage chance of hitting on a prospect by point three point five percent yeah you should be stoked about that because <laughs> the, your chance of hitting is just so low so anything that stacks that probability up in your favor you have to pay attention to it yeah Kittle was at twenty three percent which is fine. I think it's like 70th percentile, but nothing that you would have looked at his production and said, oh, this guy has to be drafted. Now, his athletic score was was pretty awesome. We look at his Raz. It was at 9.52, and he was an older prospect. Yeah. So you, there's just so many things with Kittle coming in. That you're like, I like this. I don't like this. And, and you'll find that with all these prospects. So um, any last thoughts, bets on just what we're looking for a tight end prospect, and then we're going to jump into Brower, Bowers. No, I think we hit on all the the big um, you know major points here. But just to hammer home, like it is so hard to hit on these guys for the NFL. But then you take it a step further and you say it's really hard to hit on these guys for fantasy. And remember, a lot of us like really we only care about the top twelve. And over the last you know ten years, it's really been like the top five that are like actual difference makers, right? So like the tight end twelve and the tight end fourteen are the same person as the same, you know, tight end sixteen. Like it doesn't really matter. So we're trying to find difference makers that really don't exist very often. So um I'm excited to get your guys' thoughts on these guys, especially Bowers, in terms of how he fits in that landscape, because it's hard to crack our fantasy lineups as a tight end. And, you know, we need to be really, I think, stringent on kind of what we look for to try to get that guy because like I said, there's not a lot of them that we care about in our game. All right, let's take a quick break and then we'll talk about our Georgia boy. We're back. We're talking about Brock Bowers out of Georgia. He's clearly the tight end one in all of our rankings. And it's interesting because Brock Bowers coming into college went from basically being an unknown dude who went to a Nike camp and ran a four five. And everyone's like, who is this guy? And what's funny, and, and Betts brought this up last week, so many players don't know how to run a 40 because it is a skill-based thing. It's a track thing. 
Yeah. So he ran his four five in high school. It's a high school time, so maybe there's a little bit not true there, but so oh, yeah. In high school, I was six three. <laughs> he ran it twice in a lineman stance, like he wasn't down, and everyone was laughing at him. But he ran a four five. They're like, "Who is this guy?" So who's laughing now? <laughs> he goes to Georgia, and as a freshman, puts up thirteen touchdowns on a national championship team. His production got better in a lot of areas. Now the touchdowns went down a little bit, but you look what he did against zone. He got better as the years progressed. Um, yeah. If you look at yards per team, pass attempt yards per outrun, the stuff we talk about, he's the elite of the elite of the last decade. I mean, this is not normal stuff. He's only 21 years old. And with a breakout age of 18.7, it's like every box is checked from production. I don't think any of us are going to argue with that. The bigger question is how he fits in today's NFL because he's not going to be a traditional inline blocker. This past year, he was just pass blocking on 8% of the dropbacks. So, you know, that's fine. But a lot of these Big Ten tight ends, we talk about Cade Stover or Theo Johnson, it's like 15% of the time. A.J. Barner of Michigan was 20%. So he's not going to block as much. And we kind of don't really care because we just want this guy running routes. We want fantasy points. So, Betts, give me your first takes on Bowers from just film evaluation and production. Yeah, I mean, there's really nothing you can say negative about the production profile. It's awesome when you look at his uh, targets route run, his yards route outrun, um, his ability to pile up yards and touchdowns. Like you said, as a freshman and just, you know, it's, it's unreal when you think about the age-adjusted production. College tight ends don't do what Brock Bowers did ever, really, but especially as a freshman. So, like, this guy is an elite tight end prospect, in my opinion. When you consider, too, you know, the names that I'm going to throw out are not like the best in the NFL, but he played next to a lot of NFL talent as well. A.D. Mitchell might go round one in this draft. George Pickens is a good NFL wide receiver. James Cook is a good running back. He played with all of those guys in college. Lab McConkey, obviously. So he's playing next to NFL talent and also exceeding them in terms of what he's doing as the first read in the offense. So that's encouraging to me. The other thing just to note about kind of how he was used. Think about how much Georgia valued this guy. They were using him as a runner, like on like jet sweeps and stuff like that, which again, for a college tight end is, is unheard of. So it just speaks to the uh, you know value of this guy to the offense and how good they thought he is and how good I do think he is. Yards after the catch is a major strength for this guy, especially when they get him out like in the flats. Like he's really, really tough to bring down, can pick up chunk yards um, after the catch. So we love that for our tight ends. I love the fact that you brought up that he's not necessarily going to be a traditional inline tight end where, you know, he can move into the slot. He can play on the perimeter. They can do all sorts of stuff with him, which helps give him more outs to hit for fantasy, I think. So um, I'm high on him. I mean, he's a really, really strong prospect. I think my major question for you guys is just like, do you think it's worth taking him over someone like a Brian Thomas, like a Troy Franklin, like an A.D. Mitchell? Because that's kind of the the tough choice for people, I think. Yeah, it's is a question that we will ask many times and you won't have an answer to that yeah till what year 3 more than likely more i mean he look sam sam laporta is going to break stuff a little bit for us because of his it search to dominance immediate dominance and becoming the overall tight end one or tight end two you know unanimously but don't forget at this time, all of these conversations we were having right now was how high should we draft Dalton Kincaid? Where is he? Like, he it, Sam Laporta was an interesting prospect, had the draft capital, everything you, you want, but he was not the talk of the town. Everything was Dalton Kincaid, who then landed in what felt like a pretty close to perfect situation for a team that didn't have a wide receiver too. They could like there was a like a, at least a known you f you for sure Gabe Davis is the wide receiver too. Well, is he? I mean, kind of. He's he is no longer because now he's on the Jacksonville Jaguars. So hilarious. You know the the interest the interest in Dalton Kincaid can keep growing. But back to the point of if we weren't the the discussion wasn't Sam Laporta at this time. So that that is where it becomes difficult drafting these tight ends is they just. It takes time, yes. and you are spending – in Dynasty, you, you, your windows are so small of when your team is perfectly stacked and aligned and can make a real serious run 
at a championship. And while you're drafting, you say you have the whatever, 105, 106, and there's a high draft capital wide receiver who can really help your team, maybe playing a double flex. Well, now up to four wide receivers are playing. You just have the one tight end. Is it what's better for your team to draft a guy who probably will give you more production throughout this entire season and next year or the, the guy that you have to sit on and wait and wait? And some of these tight ends who are now the coming into relevance, you know, or right, kind of back, whatever. But, you know, Najoku, Evan Ingram, you we've been waiting seven years for it to finally start happening. It seems like it's happening, but you waited forever. I mean, the, Better late than never, the, baby. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree for the player, <laughs> but it would be awesome to have the data of what percentage of teams still have Najoku or Ingram from the rookie draft. Yeah, I have a Inj- Njoku on a team it's be so low. that I, I was like, well, I can't trade him because I feel like I'm not going to get what I want because I feel like there's upside and he's obviously stupid young. Like he's just always the youngest tight end in the league. But I'm with you. Like, it, you know, Njoku was taken at the 111 in a draft. And at that point, you're like, okay, do I want to value a high floor? Because that's kind of what these tight ends are. It's like, I, I get a high floor. Yeah. But there's other wide receivers there who could just go through the roof. And that's kind of the the conversation. Like Dalton Kincaid was taken on average at the 108 last year. If you were taken there, would you guys say you'd be happy with that pick? I think I'd be happy. Tell me who the 109 and 110 That's what were. I have to look up. And that's and that's the <laughs> problem is I think Dalton Kincaid did everything he was supposed to do as a rookie. I mean, he put up, yes. I think, the fourth most rookie tight end receptions. Like it's it was a big deal what he did, but it was overshadowed by Laporta, who was taken a full round later at 208. So that's the conversation, I think, is if you take Bauer somewhere, you know, let's just say it's 105. Are you passing up a player like Brian Thomas that could go nuclear for your team? And you look... You, you, nuclear? Nuclear. Oh, nu- I went Bush, didn't I? <laughs> you did. <laughs> My southernism just came in. <laughs> N- nuclear nuclear, <laughs> nuclear. Uh, or do you want to just write it out and say you know what I know this player is going to be my team every single tight end I'll, I'll tweet out this list that was taken in the first two rounds of a rookie draft they're going to get a second contract so it's not like you're worrying is this guy going to be you know nowhere to be found where you get the Quentin Johnsons of the world it's like is this guy even going to be playing a year or two from now, right? Yep. So yep. I don't know. Is is that kind of like team need that you're? Where you think that's more important is like, or is it draft the player that you think could hit and hit like in a big way? Because Bowers, it's really a question of saying like, do you think this guy can be a Kelsey or an Andrews? And that's impossible to be able to say because no one else is like these guys. I think it's almost silly to say he's going to copy and paste what they they did. And the uh, just some also context that you can forget about Travis Kelsey and and Mark Andrews Mark Andrews was not even the first ten, tight end drafted by the team he is on the year he was drafted I have no idea why so, they did that so it was Hayden Hurst and then what well, Travis Kelsey like what what round was Kelsey I want to say As I, I want to say third let me see if I can Sounds find right. it uh yeah round three so, I mean you know the the elite guys for fantasy, the the ones that have been over over the last few years weren't even first round picks, so they just they had, you know, size. And speaking of size, do you guys worry at all that uh, Brock is not small by any stretch of the imagination? But you know, I'm seeing six three. Was that the official six, combine? Three, two, well, measure? yeah, and he yeah. didn't run at the combine, so but six. He did put on he put on some weight because I was a little bit two forty three nervous. About, I was nervous about the weight numbers I was hearing, like being in the two thirties, because that would be he doesn't. That's a that's a problem. But like Kelsey, every, everything we're comparing to Kelsey and Andrews, I'm I'm sorry, this is just where we are. Those dudes are six five, and you might, well six three to six five. It it does kind of matter too, because I mean you're also now talking longer arms, just a overall bit larger body. Uh, but so, like, do you guys worry at all that that Brock is only six three? I'm not necessarily worried about the height. I will say one thing that I've heard just kind of from other like NFL draft analysts in terms of just nitpicking Brock Bowers because it's kind of what you do in the first round of the NFL draft is like, do they? Do, will teams trust him 
in like base sets where you get like play action looks, stuff like that, or like around the goal line, play action touchdown, you know, reception, stuff like that. Which when you think about the Kyle Pitts discussion when he came out, and I'm not making a straight line comparison to their games, but like, you know, fourth overall pick, like this is a, a generational talent. He's going to be incredible. And he kind of just played wide receiver, but like wasn't as good as an actual wide receiver. You know what I mean? So like he had a thousand yards, which was great, but didn't have the touchdown production because he wasn't really a full-time player. And we've kind of seen that develop over, over Kyle Pitt's career where he's not really a full-time player. Um, and with Brock Bowers being a little undersized, I just wonder, will NFL coaching staffs be willing to throw him out there as an every down player, you know, and, and we kind of joke or, or kind of discuss the blocking thing a lot. It's like, well, what do we care if they block? It's like, well, I care if they get on the field enough. It's a B blocking, right? Or like being consideration for those snaps. So that's just my only question mark. And I do think the weight is at least something that you can bring up as a valid concern for the overall profile. Because like I said, if you're taking him in round one, you you're looking for him to be a legit difference maker. Right. And we'll talk about some of these other tight ends to give context for just size and weight. But yeah, 243 is a bit smaller. Um, you know, a lot of the... And I just ran through it. Sorry, Kyle, but I'm trying to find out. So last year's top 12 tight ends in, in fantasy scoring. Uh, I mean, number two is Evan Ingram, who's... He is a smaller guy. But the like the allure of Evan Ingram was he is a, he'll play wide PPR. receiver. So... Yeah. Yeah, if 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 that is the path forward for Brock, then you know that would work. But all the other guys are like six four or or taller. Yeah, and and as a blocker, you're going to get a lot of analysts. that's like he's a nasty blocker. It's not like he's like bad at it. He's not Pitts. He's really good at it. It's just right. in the NFL, it's a little different when you're saying, it's "Hey, you know, he's got this grit. He's got this competitiveness." Well, it's like, yeah, well, some of these guys aren't going to be playing in the NFL, so. Uh, where do you guys land just to end the conversation with Bowers? We'll move on to Jatavion Sanders, but would you be comfortable taking him at the one Oh five in a one quarterback league? Where's the line for you guys? Oh man. I think that's, I think that's fair. Okay. I, I, I think he's in the conversation with someone like Brian Thomas in our last mock. I took Brian Thomas over Brock. So I would, I would take Thomas cause he's draft capital seems so locked in as a top, you know, 18 ish type of guy. Um, so I, that's where I think I draw the line. I think one one hundred and five is fine, but you, you like it, just make sure your mind is in the right place. Of at the one hundred and five, you're still drafting a tight end. Realize that this is probably a project for your team. If you know you're taking the the best possible chance you can at it turn at him turning into one of these difference making tight ends. But even that could still take a while. Yeah. I, in Superflex, I think you're going to move down. And I, I took him at 109. And I, I would love that if I was a team that he fell to 109. But I think it's going to be 107, 108, 109, somewhere in that range. And yeah, we'll get to reassess later on. We'll do another rookie mock draft and we'll get to reassess. Like, all right, is this how we still feel? Let's move to Texas's Jatavian Sanders, who this is this may be too hot of a take here. I feel like he should not be a tight end. He came he came to school as an athlete and as a defensive end. And I just look at him so many times on the football field and I'm just like, I feel like you're out of position here. I feel like Texas said, I think I could use this athlete. Interesting. And I really think he'd be better as an like an edge rusher, which is what he was in high school. He's both. And the coaches uh, coaches basically said, Hey, we're gonna make you into a tight end. I worry because there's a lot of things that I thought watching film looking at some of his measurables that he'd be better at than what he was. And I can also look at the quarterback play at Texas that was all over the map the last couple of years too, where you can say, okay, well, there's some great worthy games, there's some great A.D. Mitchell games. Um, there's a whole year where it's basically just Bijan year. That's all they're doing. So it's hard to totally evaluate, but Jatavian Sanders is probably going to come in as the tight end two or three in the NFL draft. He's only 21 years old. He's got a great breakout age. 64245 isn't huge by any means. And in the film, I, I got sick of this. Whenever they were having like a highly publicized game, somebody would call him the big fellow, the big tight end. He's not that big <laughs> relative to the other guys. It drove me crazy. Oh man. That is that's a classic Kyle gripe if I've ever oh, heard man. one. <laughs> um so uh, Jatavian Sanders, to me, it's fine in space. It's fine. I just didn't see the explosive plays that I thought I would get from this player. I also think his feet are really choppy. It's like you have to crank the motor two or three times to really get him going. 
then he gets up to speed. But I think he's a fine prospect, but there's about two tiers from Bowers that we're talking here. It's not, it, it, there's no conversation. So Betts, what'd you think about Sanders? Well, you got to give the announcers a little credit, Kyle. I mean, Xavier Worthy was out there playing at like 165. Oh, that's what they, that's what they so were doing. <laughs> relatively speaking, he was, he was the big guy out there. Um, I, I'm with you. Like the, it's, there's encouraging signs in his profile that to me, he's like the perfect guy that you take, I don't know, round three of your rookie draft. And you just kind of sit and wait. Um, there, you know, the, the breakout age is good. 19.4. That's young. He's, he himself is young, 21 years old. We love that for the future of these tight ends. And he showed, I think some decent efficiency, 1.86 yards per run in his final season, playing next to AD Mitchell and Xavier Worthy, who might both go around one is good. Again, produced playing next to and alongside of Roshan Johnson and, and B. John Robinson, again, NFL talent. So like he can play. I just don't think he's a difference maker, if that makes sense to you guys. Uh, a little bit undersized, not the you know perfect athletic profile you want to see, but some good stuff on tape where you know he's got good hands. Uh, he does have yak ability, but like you kind of said, it does take him a little bit to get up to speed. So there's things in his profile that I'm like, yeah, I can see how it could work one day. But is that in three years? Is that in four years? Is that on a second contract? Like that's kind of the path I see for Sanders. So a guy that if you have a super deep bench. I like, or if you play with, you know, taxi squads on your dynasty roster, like I like that aspect of him, but overall I don't see a huge uh, ceiling or, or even a floor really for year, year one. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm fine with, with Sanders. I don't like that his, that the, you know, when the production profile, he kind of hit some thresholds closer to what we want as a sophomore, but then those, you know, came down, you know, it's nitpicking, but I would, I'd like to see you know, a, an ascension, you know, I want to see you used more and, and more and more and just dominate as you should, as you get older in college and you're developing as a man, uh, you should be able to dominate younger and, and less developed men out there on the field. So, and I don't know, his highlights kind of like Kyle was talking about, I don't know, there's, it's strange to me because when I'm watching Sanders, it would just go into the highlights. There's so many of them <clears throat> where he's too wide open. You know what I mean? Like, like which that's that sounds like a wild. Well, to, well the guy's well, wide seam open. Seam routes but, and stuff where it's like, okay, well, you have the ball, and I don't know if you really earned this. It's just that the scheme says that you're open. Yes, that and that's what I mean. Of it's just it's too wide open where it looks like the the play call the the the, the OC outmatched the the dc and you schemed your player to be wide open there's a difference between torching your guy and you're like oh he's open and then being someone who looks like they teleported to a different spot on the field because the rest of your players created such a situation for you so i there was a little bit too much of that again that's weird to say uh, the athleticism is fine i thought it would be so way they, better from like before testing Sure. I thought he would. I thought he would show out, but eight point oh six out of ten for the RAS score is like you said. It's good. It's not. There's no negative you could say, but it. There's other guys that just propelled themselves forward. So yeah, yeah. yeah that's well said. So um, yeah, he'll probably get day two draft capital. Somebody will say I can do something with this, and it's just really hard to say that he has a trump card in his game. Like I, I just don't see anything that says like despite being known as a great athlete that he would just come out and dominate. So. Uh, we'll see from there. Let's take a break and we'll actually get to Mike's tight end too. It's not Sanders. It's somebody else. Let's go. All right. Besides Bowers, I think this is my favorite conversation we're going to have with the tight end. It's Ben Sennett out of Kansas State, a.k.a. the Senator. Um, that's what I've deemed oh him as. Not the House oh of boy. Representatives, the Senate. Um, oh man we're first show is hot out the gate oh that, yeah huh? man <laughs> he's all about it so one of the best parts about okay. senate is um so God, it's so stupid that's the best part it's amazing. <laughs> that's the best part it's i i know i love it the senator <laughs> so senate came to kansas oh, state man. as a walk-on and basically played every sport in high school hockey was his best sport and what he wanted to do and yet he got really no offers for football um, and then the head coach of Kansas State happened to go to his high school, 
like they went to the same high school different times. And so he said, I'll give you a shot to walk on. So Sinnott really came to college as a fullback, which is why you see number 34 when you're watching film. You're like, oh, that's like old school stuff. I like it, you know? So he kind of came out of nowhere and he also came to Kansas State at 210 pounds. So he put on 40 pounds uh, and yet he tested off the charts uh, in a lot of different areas for the RAS score. So that already stands out to us. Uh, his targets per outrun this past year was 22%. Yards per outrun over two yards. So there's a lot of things here that you can like. It's also pretty raw considering he hasn't played the position that long. But he, you know, forego the bowl game. He's only 21 years old. There's a lot to like here for a player that came into college just off everyone's radar. So, uh, Mike, what do you like about Sinnott? So, uh, first and foremost is the 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 size athleticism combination. So he's six four, two fifty, but you know, like he, he, you can look at it on our player profile pages. But you know, his his vertical and his broad jump are so his vertical is a ninety eighth percentile. His broad jump is ninety fifth percentile. So that turns into uh, his explosive score is ninety eighth percentile. I mean, this is. This is truly top tier athletic stuff we're talking about. Hit uh, the he didn't hit all the production thresholds that we want out of uh, his final year, but pretty good, you know, like, pretty good. And then when watching him, he he just he felt like a a true go to player, where he, like manufacturing screens for him, making him a deep threat. He just it felt like kind of all over the field and not just in one particular place that he was really being utilized by the offense and and in college when people it can be you know kind of annoying for us to to evaluate the talent of a player especially wide receivers who are getting nothing but screens but in college they're just you work with what you have and maybe your quarterback has to do this and you're just you're saying I need to get the ball into the hands of a playmaker, which is often why we give you know a slight a, a, a slight percentage bump to players who get punt return or kick return work because the staff is where in the NFL that's essentially like that's a little too dangerous. I don't want my superstar wide receiver returning kicks because of the chance of injury. But in college, it's no, I need my superstar to touch the ball every single time that they can possibly touch the ball. So I just I liked the usage that I, I saw out of Senate, then combines with the production profile, and then the athleticism testing took it over the top for me. Yeah, he's he's a really interesting player because when you watch him, you know, there's nothing that stands out of like this guy is incredible. When I when I saw him anyway, he's incredible at like this thing. He's just good at everything. Reliable right. as a pass well catcher. Rounded. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well rounded. Like you said, kind of used him all over the field, put him in the backfield a little bit, put him in end of the line, put him in the slot, like just kind of moving him all over the place. And then you see the athletic profile and you're like, whoa, we got to pay attention to this guy. So um yeah, I like him too. Again, a guy that you could probably get, I don't know, fourth round of your rookie draft. And I would love to have him and just see what happens. Um, so I'm, I'm very interested in him. I think he's a, a really fun tight end that no one's really talking about in this class. Everyone's like, oh, it's Bowers. And then everyone's kind of excited about Sanders, but I wouldn't be surprised if in, you know, three years we look back and we're like, huh, he was actually better than Sanders. We should have taken him ahead. So I like him, especially for the value where you can get him in rookie drafts. Yeah. It'll be interesting to team fit. Cause he's one of those move tight ends. We talked about like, you kind of can put him all over the place. He was a fullback. He's this kind of bowling ball as a blocker. And, uh, I mean, I wish I had a metric for this, but the grit levels just off the charts, guys. I mean, he's just willing to give his body. Um, Does he have that dog? Can, how do we get the medical people to release the the their T count? <laughs> just, <laughs> just we just HIPAA, Mike HIPAA. We send in like a little, you know, just a little message online. It's just like, hey, we work for this fans football podcast. We just want to see your <laughs> testosterone levels. There's nothing weird about it. Nothing. We just want to know, you know, how's it going. Um, I will. You football guys, they're testing for this, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if we, if you're running a full medical diagnostic on a player, I'm I'm out of my realm here. So I'm just speaking. Bets, tell us, tell us what butt. medical things happen. But <laughs> not that. That's got to be one. Of, that's got to be one of the things. You know, like with football guys in particular, I have to imagine like, what's this kid's T level? What? How much testosterone this kid got? I need to know. I need to know if they got the dog. 
Uh, that- I love Kyle's research, by the way. Like just hearing you kind of give the background on his high school, you know, and and how that kind of worked out. Uh, college hockey player. Yeah, you're a sick individual, Kyle. <laughs> South I, I love Dakota it. Coyotes. He was going to go there, but uh, just enrolled as a walk on. He. I will say this. He didn't really run nuanced routes. And with tight end, we give a little bit of leeway where it's like, okay, well, you're not always asked to run these like crazy, you know, routes. You're basically asked sometimes to kind of flood into a zone. And I think against zone, he was good. So I like that. That's what I need. Yeah. I need a smart football player who sees the soft spot and sits down. Yeah. I mean, we're talking here, you know, fourth round pick probably is where he's going to probably land somewhere around their fourth, fifth round. So uh, it just depends on the right fit for him. Let's move on to Cade Stover of Ohio State. He's a redshirt senior, so a little bit older. He came into college as a linebacker slash running back. Notice I didn't say tight end, but in Ohio, he's Mr. Football. He played special teams for the first couple years, and if you really think back, like Ohio State's had a lot of tight ends drafted in the NFL. I'm not saying that they've been good, but like going back to Nick Vanette, uh, Luke Farrell got drafted in 2021. Jeremy Ruckert got drafted in the third round. 2022. These are guys that were ahead of him on the depth chart that have done nothing for fantasy, but they're guys that are actually like been drafted. So Ohio State's put out a couple of guys. He's just really old. And yeah, what well, he's almost 24. So he'll, he will be 24 for his rookie season and his breakout age was just this last season. Yeah, If he gets drafted so over the age of 23, if he gets drafted in the first five rounds. He will be the fifth oldest tight end over the last decade. He's no Jordan Akins, who was 26 when he got drafted, which just is hilarious. Uh, so he's old. He he was fine. <laughs> As a lot of C.J. Stroud stuff, when you look back a year before, it's like, oh, well, am I looking at C.J. Stroud film or am I looking at Cade Stover film? So I don't know, Betts, do you have some takes? Like I'm already feel like I just, for fantasy, I can't see it. This is the part of the podcast where you got to squint pretty hard to see, to see the path. Um, you know, you mentioned it just an older guy that took this long to do anything. So like he's playing against like 19 year old and 20 year olds out there as an almost 24 year old guy. Like it took a while, you know, he's, he's okay after the catch where like he gets the ball, he can turn up field, but he's not going to really make you miss with like lateral agility, quickness type stuff. So, um, yeah, not, not a lot of excitement for me. Obviously I will say, Really reliable hands, just had two drops on 100 plus targets over the last couple seasons. So he can catch the ball, but there's a lot of not good in, in the profile. He can sit in zone. And I think that's another thing that we're talking about. It's like, okay, can they sit in, uh, you know, in an NFL offense where you can see this work and it works for fantasy and you get some PPR value? It can work. But once again, this is CJ Stroud, you know. Boosting a lot of these players' profiles and what he did two years ago in the intermediate area. So I, I just think at the end of the day, I'm going to bet against a player that's about to be 24 years old. Yeah, my whole kind of monologue I went off of about a a player who's dominating at a young age or dominating at an old age. I mean, being over the age of 23, playing against kids who so are so old. Oh, I. It's all relative, Kyle, <laughs> playing against kids who are 19, 20 years old. Like you should, you should dominate them. And we just didn't see any true domination until finally, what did we got? His fifth year here, technically speaking, uh, which 41 for 576 and five. That's, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Oh man, I feel like we're just crapping all over this kid. He he feels I, I can't find it, guys. I can't find the good he stuff. He feels exactly like just the next Ohio State tight end in the list that Kyle mentioned. We're like, you got drafted, played a handful of years in the league, never really cracked our lineups. That's that's really what I see. Yeah. No, he peaked in high school. Ohio's Mr. Football. That's pretty good, man. It's better than me. <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't peak. We're talking we're talking we about all? fantasy football. He can be a, a great NFL player. We don't know. He'll probably pop exactly. up and have some weeks where he can fill in as a, you know, backup tight end or street. We're going to talk about him as a streeting tight end in like two years, aren't we? That's probably what's going to happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For one week. It's the best, though. All right. Let's move on to Jaheim Bell, Florida State. He's interesting when you bring in the context of like, okay, this is a faster looking dude, but he's only 6'2". 
And that's really rare to find a tight end that this small. He was a four-star recruit out of Aldosta, tore his ACL his senior year, and then kind of slowly got brought along at South Carolina until they just didn't play him. Like, if you look in 2021, he was coming on strong. He showed out in their bowl game with 159 yards, two touchdowns the next season. They just, like, took out his snaps. His routes run were like eight, four, six, and then this is the big thing, guys. His mama tweeted, and she was not happy. Uh-oh. His mama said, mama why, why is he not getting playing time? And so then he transfers to Florida you State. You should have asked the same thing about uh, Leggett. Why aren't these dudes <laughs> okay. playing? That, that <laughs> yeah. did cross my mind. That like I wonder if like Hold the on. parents were looking around, looking around like, what is going on with this team in 2022? Because no one apparently was playing the right players. Do we have, yeah, some terrible talent evaluators there? What is Or some... Some coaches who are hurt, holding like ridiculous personal grudges. Uh, what is happening? Down we got to enlist a team, some boots on the ground uh, to go there and figure it out. But he's really short for a tight end. Just to give you some context, like yes. there's very few tight ends that are six, two or below that have been drafted. Uh, Irv Smith was about the same. So, and Irv Smith was drafted 50th overall, uh, never really came together with injuries, but so shorter, they used him a lot in Kyle, space. You're for, you're forgetting one. You 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 talking about uh, Evan Ingram on here? No, no, that's that's too tall for this range. No, we're talking about the greatness, Jordan Reed. Okay, no, I think I I think he was before my cutoff of what I've done the last decade. Okay, now there was All right, yeah. there was Jalen Samuels who was technically a tight end, but he was also a running back. Anyway, we'll we'll go through that later. Uh, I don't really know how he's going to be used in the NFL. Out South Carolina, he was kind of a move tight end out of the backfield. And then at Florida State, it's like they used him in space. They used him in screens. I just don't really know how this is going to translate in the NFL because he's just he's not going to be able to block at all. Like they're not going to be able to use him that way. So it's like you only can use him in certain sets as kind of this out of the backfield. We use in a certain way, like a Johnu Smith and... So I, I think it's hard for me to see him as an every down player, and thus like I did the opportunity is going to be pretty small. Yeah, I mean we mentioned his, it with Brock Bowers, right? It's like, is this is he going to be a full time player if he's not you know heavy enough? And then you look at this guy and you're like, he's six two two forty one, like he's he's almost certainly not going to be a full time player. So that really you know lowers the floor, certainly caps the ceiling on a guy like this. I will say like this final season. Keon Coleman, you know, 650 or so yards. Johnny Wilson is probably going to be a late round pick. He's an NFL talent. Jaheim Bell, 500 yards. Like he produced next to NFL players, but that's in college. And I don't know. I, I, I see where he has a role in the NFL. I struggle to see where it hits for fantasy. He is, because I'm bringing up the comp of Jordan Reed, of basically just dry, uh, drafting a really athletic guy, calling him the tight end because sometimes he'll be on the line and call. sometimes he'll be in the slot. So, and and he, the the athletic testing was good. It not elite, but but it's very good and I bet's his point of you're producing next to other NFL talent. So, he is he is firmly on my radar of the draft capital and the team watch cuz I think there are there's places he could end up where it would become very exciting. Yeah, and that was the thing I I think pointing out Reed's a good point is like it was the perfect marriage of a raw athlete in a system that they could utilize him, and there really wasn't as much competition. Where it's like, oh, he they can funnel this guy targets. Where on a lot of teams, it's like, hey, exactly, well, you know, you're you're going to be the fourth or fifth guy. It's not going to work out. So we'll see where he lands. Um, definitely interesting, you know, with the speed, but more of an athlete than a traditional inline tight end. Um, let's finish talking about one more athlete. Speaking of Theo Johnson. Out of Penn State, 6'6", 259, with basically a perfect RAS score. Behind only Jelani Woods. And uh, in terms of tight ends drafted in the first five rounds, like it's pretty wild. Coming out of high school, he was the number three tight end recruit in his class behind Michael Mayer. And he came out of Canada, so it's probably why you hadn't heard of him. Um, and Soft, I got you. <laughs> Just take a shot at <laughs> take that Canada. Take that entire nation just get on blast. <laughs> um it took him a while though. So despite the athletic measurables, this is a player that I'm trying to weigh how the NFL is going to feel about him. He's 23 years old and 
his yards per route run is pretty low. Uh, 1.26 is final college season. There's only been two tight ends over the last decade with a top 10 fantasy season that were around this marker below. Dawson Knox and Dalton Schultz, and then a bunch of bodies of people you're like, I forgot they were in the league. So the production's not great. Uh, keep in mind, Penn State has had a lot of tight ends that have come through the NFL. Gesicki, Fryermuth, Brenton Strange got drafted in the second round last year. Which also a reminder, Gesicki destroyed the, the combine, combine as well. That was the Saquon year, right? Uh, yeah, in 2018. I think so. So, I mean, we're all... What is going on in Penn State? Bets, talk to us. You got you go to all the games. Yeah, I, I think they just recruit super athletic kids. And then th- their sports science program is literally insane. I actually went to a spring practice last year and their facilities are like out of this world. So they know what they're doing as far as building up athletes. I'm not sure this is a great football player for fantasy. Um, we saw Zach Kuntz out of Penn State, or he had ties to Penn State rather. Um, a guy that everyone like was like late in your rookie draft, Zach Coons, like he could be the answer this year. I don't even know if he played a snap. Seventh right, round, as a rookie. yeah, seventh round for the Jets last year. So this is the perfect like the RAS score and the testing and the size are giving him a path. But if you just take a step back and you look at what he did in college, it was basically nothing. Um, and that and this Penn State roster didn't really have a lot of elite wide receiver talent either. So I. I get it i get why you'd be excited that i just don't want people to get out you know over their skis so to speak on a guy that forced seven missed tackles over four years of college not great bob <laughs> no no that's that's not great and he let's see uh his fourth year so his, his final year as a player he surpassed the 340 yard mark there you go so he's got got that going there was seven touchdowns so that's you know that's nice. We do like that. But he will be another just pay attention because when you when you show out that athletically, there are gonna be handfuls of coaches who say, Give me that kid and I can make it work. So we'll we'll see who takes the gamble and, and at what point. But again, everything is just finding finding tiny little things that you can stack on each other that are the probability in your uh in your favor. If Theo Johnson somehow somehow got a day two draft capital at a place where there's really only a wide receiver one, my my eyebrows will go up and I'll try and convince myself that this guy who has done nothing can work out and be a good fantasy tight end. I think the key point here, because earlier we talked about combine metrics and how we care about them. What we care is if they line up with production. It's really weird when you see a player it's like, oh, they're so athletic. Wait a second. Why did they do nothing? And when you watch a little bit of Theo Johnson, you see little moments you're like, oh, this dude's big. Um, he can't really sit in zone. He's kind of stiff. And as a blocker, I feel like, like you should be dominating people if you're 6'6", 259. And there's a yes. number of things that... And that's strong. Yes, and there's a number of things where he didn't show up very well in college. So I just worried that he's a player that's going to be overdrafted, you know, just based on his RAS score, where we want it to align with production. It's not just like, here's a random metric. That's the only metric we look at. Uh, Usually want those things to coexist because they make sense. Like, oh, you know, with at least with Kyle Pitts, you saw him test off the charts and you saw the production at Florida that matched that. Mm -hmm. So um, Theo Johnson will be interesting. Those are our top six tight ends. There's other names I really don't want to go into unless Betts really wants me to go really deep on Dallin Holker, who's about, I don't know, 80 years old. Oh, please don't. (laughs) Don't make (laughs) us do this, Kyle. I was, uh, I was messaging with Kyle this morning. I'm looking at the doc, getting ready for the show, you know, grinding the tape. And I see this guy on the list. I'm like, Kyle, what are we doing here? He's like, oh, we got to talk about this guy. He's my sleeper in this class. I think not- he's going to hit guaranteed. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll let Kyle talk about this uh, 27-year-old 7.36 RAS score tight end that produced in his final year of college. Dude, he's about to be 24. He missed two years based on his, you know, Mormon mission stuff. He, he okay. had COVID. But be, uh, what if I should probably t- say the player's name, by the way, <laughs> Dolan Holker out of Colorado State, originally from Thank BYU. You. But Mike, can I at least say that this is the same college that produced Trey McBride and Crockett Gilmore? Yeah, you, you can say these things. That's that. I, I don't mind facts being there you go. put out into the world. I mean, he, they used him a ton. So if you look at like pure production stuff, 
I'm not saying this guy's going to be a dude at all. Okay, please hear me out. But uh, you're he, not not saying he, you're uh, you are inferring. No, I just wanted to mention his name <laughs> for no other reason than if he has success, I will cut out this audio clip and I will tweet it out. No, I want to <laughs> if he gets drafted in the NFL. Now there's a bunch of other dudes, and they're in our production profiles. If you want to look through them. For the NFL and for fantasy, it's really hard to kind of go all out on a name. Um, there's other players that put up nice combine numbers like Tip Raymond from Illinois. He's just going to be a big blocker. Devin Colt from Washington, he's just fast, but their production doesn't really match. So all of those names you can find in the Dynasty Pass part of the Ultimate Draft Kit Plus. So I won't go any further on tight ends. That would be like our separate bonus, you know, secret, super secret episode that we go through the top like Hundred tight ends. People love that kind of content. Hit on all the all the UDFA's at tight end. Oh man, that's that's our next level, Mike. Is that we have a UDFA <laughs> podcast? <laughs> we talk to guys that almost got a job, that are almost employed. Yeah, and now <laughs> talk about the what show. they're doing now. Yep. All right, that's gonna do it for this episode. We'll be back next week talking free agency and team opportunity. Have a good week. Goodbye. Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Footballers Dynasty Podcast. If you want to take your dynasty skills to the next level, check out the fantasyfootballers.com.